Hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our discussion today. We're talking about um, this extremely important topic. It's titled, you know, Navigating Digital Frontiers of Cyber Warfare. You know, as new generations of first-time internet users, we've come online. There is this important need to raise awareness of these new types of cyber threats. In the 1990s, when the internet was accessible on desktops, and the primary threat was always viruses and malware developed by individual programmers, and often small collectors. However, when we fast forward to today, um, this threat has become significant. Today, you know, today we have governments who are attacking each other and using, uh, and using viruses and in digital attacks to attack one, one nation state and the other. Um, I'm very excited and very happy that the Observer Research Foundation and Digital Peace Now together have been hosting, are hosting this panel discussion. Uh, it'll be followed by an interaction with students. Um, and we aim to talk about the role of the state uh, and uh, the role of the state and that what it plays in global cyber warfare and disarmament efforts. Um, and I'm very happy to introduce our first keynote speaker, Vice Admiral Girish, uh, Girish Lutra. He's a distinguished OR, ORF fellow. Um, he's from Bombay. He's the former commander in chief of the Western Naval Command and Southern Naval Command in the Indian Navy. Um, thank you so much, uh, Admiral uh, Lutra. It's so nice to have you. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh Good morning or good afternoon, depending upon where you are, to our distinguished panelists and the members of the audience. Um, at the outset, I would like to thank the organizing team uh, for this opportunity to speak at this event on navigating the digital frontiers of cyber warfare. With the ubiquity of the internet, advances in digital technologies and unprecedented all-round digital transformation, we have willy-nilly entered this new digital age. The connotation and application of cyberspace has also expanded exponentially, and this trend is likely to continue, if not gain momentum. Let me say a few words first related to some historical background. In the late 1980s and early 90s, people were far from optimistic about the future of cyberspace. There was, there was a debate and many, some people were very optimistic and some were less optimistic. There was increased interconnectedness being seen and there was real-time exchange of information across borders. And this was exciting to a lot of people. Barriers to understanding people from other countries and cultures were being brought down. Real-time communication and free knowledge were being made accessible and netizens were considered far more aware. In 1996, John Perry Barlow, a political activist, writer and lyricist, published a fiery manifesto declaring that cyberspace was sovereign and independent. Its users needed no government, no oversight, he had proclaimed. He believed that all persons connected to cyberspace would deliberate or conduct themselves ethically to adhere to the rules and regulations of this new frontier and would reject the coercive imposition of a government authority. This thought process influenced many developers of that period who created the current giant internet corporations. But in current times, the need for a very balanced approach in moving towards the new digital age has become essential. Against this backdrop, it is worth remembering the origins of the internet in the US within the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, the DARPA, DARPA needed an infrastructure that could connect and communicate with different military computers and installations to exchange real-time information and improve 
military tactical decision making. Thus, ARPANET, the precursor to the modern day internet, was born. Scholars still debate the design goals of the ARPANET. Some attribute that ARPANET was created for several redundant communication systems in the event of nuclear war and to establish a military command and control system. Few others hold the view that the prime objective of ARPANET was to demonstrate the interconnectedness of military computer systems. Nonetheless, it is worth remembering that initially cyberspace was not created as a utopian and egalitarian tool. It was only after ARPANET was opened up to the private sector that non-military applications evolved and at a rapid pace. It is also worth remembering that many of the engineers and scientists who built modern computer systems were deeply embedded in the counterculture movement in the United States in the 1960s. As this movement died down, many of these engineers still carried some of their spirit to challenge government systems. They endorsed a libertarian philosophy to decrease or eliminate the role of the state. In sharp contrast to this background, we have now moved to new debates about data governance frameworks, both nationally and internationally, which should take into account the interests of citizens, governments, and the industry. In addition, we are witnessing ongoing debates about data ownership, data localization, data sovereignty, data empowerment, data neutrality, digital connectivity, and data privacy. Nations are attempting to adapt to the new reality of data and networks being the new currency, and different legal, regulatory, and policy initiatives are underway in many countries. The Global Digital Public Goods Alliance and India's data empowerment and protection architecture are some examples on the emphasis being accorded in this area. While there are numerous all-round benefits of these growth and future-oriented policies and strategies, a number of threats and challenges have also come to the fore. Incidents of commercial espionage, IPR theft, technology and military intelligence, surveillance, denial of service, and other attacks in this domain have, been, have shown an increasing trend. While charting new areas of cyberspace, countries will have to contend with new forms of vulnerabilities, ranging from coordinated attacks to exploit zero-day vulnerabilities of critical infrastructure to global misinformation and disinformation. These are intended many times to weaken and undermine a country in different domains. Many entities and individuals continue working on developing cyber tools or cyber weapons, as some prefer to call it. Consequently, there have been calls for some treaty or convention or code of conduct for regulating cyberspace and cyber weapons. This is linked to a broader quest to strengthen strategic stability in a digitized global environment. Let me now highlight some unique challenges of cyberspace. As most of us know, there are no geographical boundaries and tools can be routed through servers or VPNs in widely dispersed locations. There is a thin line between malicious and non-malicious software. Millions of viruses get introduced every year with rapid multiplication. Listing or classification of cyber tools or cyber weapons is impractical, even with exclusion clauses, as was the case in some other treaties. Dual-use software is very different from dual-use chemical, nuclear, or space technologies. Hardware, software, including embedded software, networks, 
domains, SCADA systems, protocol layers, analytics, etc., bring in different dimensions. There are also associated risks from value chains related to IT systems and products. Identity of originator of a cyber incident can be easily concealed. And degree of difficulty towards compliance and verification for any regulatory or monitoring framework far exceeds our earlier experiences in different domains. It is also apparent that while some earlier arms control mechanisms in other domains focused on prohibition or limitation on development and testing, their physical deployment, buildup of arsenal, or their actual usage, but most of these models do not apply to the cyber domain. Export control mechanisms, particularly for limiting cyber offensive capabilities, bring in yet another different set of challenges. I will now briefly talk about national level perspectives and challenges. Firstly, there is a need to distinguish between cyber crime and cyber warfare. Cyber warfare that has implications for national sovereignty and security. Cyber threats at the national level are applicable in all domains, economic, diplomatic, military, informational, and socio-cultural. Power grids, transportation, financial services, banking, health, and many such critical sectors have vulnerabilities that can be exploited by those who are inimical to national interests. Cyberspace applications today include surveillance, intelligence, and actual conduct of security operations, both defensive and offensive. Some countries have outlined their cyber doctrines. These were not existing earlier, but now a number of countries have outlined cyber doctrines and strategies with national and military security as the backdrop. There are also moves to shift from a reactive to a proactive strategy. Further, terms like deterrence, escalation, preemption, and retaliation have now been included in some do uh, doctrines, cyber doctrines of many countries. Militaries today are increasingly dependent on ICT networks. With this transformation, militaries too have become increasingly dependent on ICT networks for conduct of their operations. Requirements of situational awareness, network-centric warfare, and information dominance have led to focus on ICT capabilities. Consequently, these have also led to many anxieties. Cyber structures are being created in defense forces around the world to factor in these dimensions of warfare. It is pertinent to mention that cyber domain also offers an attractive option for asymmetric warfare in terms of offsetting conventional superiority. Further, attacks on critical ICT networks can provide significantly higher military advantages than physical attacks on some of these targets. Such cyber attacks also provide surprise and desired effect with the added advantage of deniability. There have been reports, as some of you may be aware, that since around 2008, cyber operations have preceded or run in parallel with conventional military operations in many instances. It is hardly surprising, therefore, that some countries consider cyber to be one of the biggest national security threat. Cybersecurity has also gained prominence in the overall cooperation framework of like-minded countries. Today, you know, when, uh, when a number of countries have their uh, summits for cooperation and high-level leadership-level uh, dialogues, cybersecurity is top of the agenda simply because they recognize the potential impact of some of the threats which are faced commonly by these countries. Therefore, it is important 
for policymakers, professionals, and common people to understand the challenges to peaceful usage of cyberspace and to realize its potential in a positive manner. I am pleased that Digital Peace Now and the Observer Research Foundation have come together for this online discussion to navigate the new frontiers of cyber warfare. The panel discussion will also deal with three case studies of cyber incidents that pose a threat to national sovereignty and a country's critical infrastructure and assets. I hope that the audience joining us today will benefit from this panel discussion and will work or contribute towards building a healthier cyber, cyberspace ecosystem of the future. I wish you all a fruitful and enriching session. Thank you. And I now request uh, Gurmeher to initiate uh, and take forward the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Thank you so much for laying the groundwork to our discussion. Uh, and you could not set it right today. We are living in a highly, a highly weaponized internet. We're living in a highly weaponized cyberspace. Um, and, you know, as our digital world, it becomes increasing like weaponized, you know, efforts to take actions, you know, have yet to be emerged. Um, in 2018, the Paris call for trust and cybersecurity, um, for trust uh, and cybersecurity in cyberspace, you know, it, it is one of the most extensive multi-stakeholder agreement on cybersecurity that's advocating uh, global principles to promote a rules-based international order online. Um, and it is yet, and the sad news is yet to be ratified democracies like the United States, uh, where the digital peace now is located, uh, and my own country, India, where we are speaking today. And, you know, and this is deeply, deeply worrying. Uh, but, you know, just speaking upon the worries we're facing um, in cyberspace, I would like to, you know, while keeping, keeping, keeping uh, Admiral Luthra's uh, thoughts um, and opinions in mind, I would also like to start this panel uh, and introduce, introduce our speakers, uh, Michael Brown, uh, the, Dipsy, uh, the Deputy Council General of the Australian Consulate uh, in Mumbai. Uh, Michael Brown is a career diplomat with the de uh, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and most recently served in International Law Section. He has previously served at the Australian High Commission in New Delhi, the Australian Embassy in The Hague, and the Australian Embassy in Bangkok. Out of the department, he's experienced, uh, you know, he experienced working in Africa, the Pacific, and China. He has a master's in international law from University College London, a bachelor's of law uh, from the Australian National University, and a bachelor's of international relation from Griffith University, Brisbane. Um, and next, I'd love to introduce Samriddhi Arora, a Supreme Court lawyer. Uh, Samriti is an advocate based in New Delhi, India, where she actively practices before the Supreme Court of India. Various other high courts, Delhi subordinates, and different tribunals. Um, in 2020, she was appointed as a member of UNESCO's Information Accessibility Working Group. She also chairs the Artificial Intelligence uh, for Information Accessibility uh, Conference of the UNESCO Information for All program. Uh, our next speaker is e Ellen Klaser co-founder of Three, Three Consulting Johannesburg. Uh, Ellis, uh, El, you know, Ellen Klauser is co-founder of Three Consulting. It's a boutique consulting and research company in South Africa. She works as a researcher, investigative analyst, and a certified ethics practitioner across all sectors. She's also a coordinator of Information Ethics Network for Africa, a partner liaison for the International Center for Information Ethics, and a member of the UNESCO IFAP Working Group for Information Accessibility. And currently, she's a research fellow of the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project. Um, our next speaker is Arindrajit Basu, Research Lead, Center for Internet Society. Uh, Arindrajit is a research lead at the, you know, like I said, Center for Internet Society India, primarily working on geopolitics, constitutionality of emerging technologies. A lawyer by training, he holds a BA 
uh, an LLB honors degree from uh, the National University of Judicial Sciences, Calcutta, and uh, an LLM in international law from University of Cambridge. Um, Atmaram Shilke is an associate professor at Symbiosis Law School, Pune, a constituent of Symbiosis National University. He's a PhD and a recipient of medals in his LLM studies at Symbiosis International University. Shilke is an expert on copyrights in cyberspace. Um, you know, he's also authored several research papers and contributed to international journals. Uh, I would also like to introduce myself. I'm Gurmeher Kaur, the Global Ambassador for Digital Peace Now, also your moderator tonight. Uh, I'm a writer, social activist, uh, and very excited to be moderating this conversation. Um, thank you so much to our speakers for joining us. Um, and I would, you know, love to open a panel, uh, open our panel discussion uh, with some opening remarks from all of you uh, on our topic of today, which is um, navigating digital frontiers of cyber warfare. When we talk about navigating digital frontiers of cyber warfare, uh, what are the few uh, immediate thoughts that come to, um, you know, that come to your mind? Um, maybe Erin, would you want to go first? Thank you so much. Um, I think some of the, the things that um, Vice Admiral Luther said in his opening remarks really touched a uh, home base for me um, from a South African perspective. And uh, the, the idea of weaponizing the internet, and I think in particular, some of the experiences that we've had recently and the, the weaponizing of social media for political um, for political purposes or to push forward certain political agendas. And I think that that's something that is, is on the minds of many people and many countries who have experienced that as well. Um, the manipulation of information and the manipulation of data to push certain information to certain individuals. Um, and, and that becomes a threat to the, the sovereignty and the authority of a state. Um, and then on the other hand, the, the issues discussed on supply chain challenges. We recently experienced a number of cyber attacks on and entities and I think that we underestimate especially in our in the new uh, sort of the new normal of COVID-19 how vulnerable our, our state entities have become to these cyber attacks and uh, I yeah I'm going to enjoy listening to everybody else's comments about that as well. Thank you so much Aaron. So Mriti maybe you'd want to go next? Yeah, I actually agree with Erin what she has said that in COVID-19, this is increasing this cyber warfare and cyber attacks they have been increasing and there have been cyber war, you know, cyber war instances like in 2010, like till 2021, they have been increasing day by day. I'll discuss like in 2020. In 2010, there was one Stuxnet, a computer worm, which was basically originally aimed at Iran's nuclear facilities, uh, which was basically designed to inflict physical damage. There have been so many instances like this, like in 2014 also, there was one Russian-based hacking group took a Ukraine election commission and to create a cure. In 2015, Chinese hackers stole 21.5 million records from United States Office of Personal Management. And as per the, you know, the case study which we have received in 2019, their, you know, uptake, uh, oil processing attack. Um, it was basically an oil refinery which were attacked using drones and cruise missiles and damage caused to the refineries the damage caused to the refineries and it was basically which actually dropped 50 percent of saudi arabia the arabia's uh, oil production and uh, it has been gone you know as per in 2017 there was a presidential election and in france the fake news came out uh, regarding you know saudi arabia's and uh, presidential election of uh, France, they had basically, you know, uh, a fake news was there, which was on all newspapers, media channels. It has actually 
you know we can say that all are the instances of cyber war um this information or such fake news can shake democracy as, as to its core so in a nutshell it this information and in something it's like that it is basically affecting the nation's consensus too so even in india i'll take example of india we like boomers on messaging platforms like whatsapp allegedly incited violence across the country and national government itself has tried to issue fake news guidelines in the past in october it was reported that indian government had turned off the internet more than 100 times over the past years to quell the spread of rumors on whatsapp so there have been instances and this cyber war it has been growing day by day it is never ending you know so i would like to hear other people so that we can now move to the solutions after to that thank you so much for thank you so much for coming out the cyber attacks that we will uh, be discuss mr michael brown thank you so much for giving us some really the indian perspective specifically but i would love to hear uh, mr michael brown on um, a bit more of an international perspective on um, the state of cyber warfare and just follow up on your comments Thanks Kumaha and thanks to ORF and Digital Peace Now. I think it's really exciting that we can get a group of young people uh sort of maybe like yourselves uh together to discuss one of the most topical issues that I think uh is facing us um at the moment. Obviously, I'm speaking more from my personal capacity um and everything that I sort of I I think I've got some exciting things to to say today. uh but everything's from the public domain uh and, and very accessible um in my previous life before i came back to india i was working directly on the mh17 downing now i don't know if everyone can remember but this was the malaysian airlines flight that was shot down in 2014 uh in that role i wasn't responsible for countering any disinformation or uh, attributing uh, any of the cyber actions that happened um around the downing to any country uh but was very much involved uh in 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 a piece of work that experienced a large amount of disinformation and my own country made a couple of uh, attributions um attributing malicious cyber activity uh against Russia um for actions that took place um around the investigation uh from a disinformation perspective uh there are a lot of facts released into the public uh essentially the entire story um about what happened to MH17 and it's almost uh from my perspective and I know the investigators and the police that worked um on the investigation it's almost undeniable uh that a russian missile launcher and russian missile were used to shoot down this plane um but what we've seen is that is a very active um and an organized sort of chaos uh disinformation effort against uh what's happened and the investigation you see heaps of theories published uh online uh alleging all kinds of different uh different um theories of what happened from a CIA bomb to uh, a Ukrainian jet flying at an, an impossibly high altitude and and some of these stick and they gain momentum online and you can see uh that they're shared primarily through Twitter and they just build build traction and gain momentum until eventually they're picked up by more mainstream media or even governments you can see that there's sort of thousands of tweets tens of thousands of tweets millions of tweets that build up around the anniversary date around the release of different pieces of information that the investigation puts out so it's really interesting to watch these uh the disinformation campaign uh get carried out and a lot of these accounts um are explicitly linked well not explicitly but have been linked to the russian um internet research agency which is their disinformation wing um and then i suppose another interesting element that that i get to be part well that i've uh, that i've been part of um is around the government response to this uh so 
there's been a number of attributions that Australia and partners have made um, in response to, uh, in particular, some Russian hacking um, of the OPCW. Now, that's the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons. I never remember. Uh, some Russian spies were arrested by Dutch police outside of this UN agency. They had hacked into it uh, and they were uh, stealing data. When the the spies were that their, their, their equipment was analysed, it was discovered that they had also hacked the MH17 investigation in Malaysia uh, and had stolen a bunch of information um, from there. And so Australia and the Netherlands and the UK, um, potentially with some other partners, attributed uh, this this action to the to the Russian government. But really, attribution is sort of tricky. Uh, it's really time consuming to do. To be able to definitively say uh, one plus one equals two takes a long time. And you know, I, I, I went I went online and looked at some of Australia's media releases around this, uh, and, and I, I dredged out one where we we we, we made this attribution. Uh, it's from 2018. Uh, but at the same time, we were attributing some actions in 2015. It, it took this long for the state to be able to say definitively that this is what happened. So it, it takes a long, a, a really long time for states to work out, uh, as well as for businesses to work out what exactly has happened. Um, but I think it's increasing in 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 occurring. It's increasing in 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 in, in um, circumstance as well. I think this year Australia has attributed three times uh, cyber attacks to different countries. Uh, mostly countries do it in uh, in partnerships, and mostly it's against North Korea, China, Russia, or Iran. Um, so I think governments are still really struggling to figure out exactly how how to do this and how to combat disinformation and how to combat uh, cyber attacks on their nationals or on the governments themselves or, or businesses. So, yeah, really interested to hear today and, and thanks for the initiative. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Brown. Um, but, you know, I do want to talk about a bit, uh, you know, the attacks that somebody spoke about and um, uh, Arendrajit, I want to, I would love your thoughts and thoughts thoughts and opinions on this. You know, she spoke about the Abkakuri's oil processing facilities attack using the drones. Uh, you know, we've also spoken about the global disinformation campaign and sort of how they affect, you know, nation's consensus building. That's something Mr. Brown touched upon. Um, and Arindrajit, a lot of your work is based in India. Um, in March 2021, there was a malware attack on Mumbai's power system. Um, you know, it, and it led to large, large-scale out outages. It's, it's, it's a it's an attack that the New York Times uncovered and wrote about many months later. Um, you know, I would like to know how do you, you know, these are a few cyber attacks that we're focusing on today. How does, how do you, could you tell us how these cyber attacks paint the picture of cyber warfare's evolving landscape? Thank, thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Gurmeher, for, uh, for really uh, uh, Introducing my uh, my piece so so eloquently, and it's really difficult to, of course, follow such excellent panelists. Thanks also to the organizers. So maybe what I'll do is I'll start off by uh, talking a little bit about the global landscape, and then coming to India and the specific uh, attack that you had uh, uh, th that you spoke about, because I think those two are are linked. So when we speak about the global landscape, obviously it's been touched about uh, touched upon by all the speakers before. Uh, starting with Admiral Luthra, we have new states. It's no longer a, a bipolar. Uh, world order. We have new rules necessitated by that. So what is a use of force in cyberspace? What is self-defense in cyberspace? These questions are still to a certain extent contested even in traditional international law and states are obviously debating how to apply them to cyberspace. And, and the attack that you spoke about is, is one, one such attack. And of course, we have new actors, which I think is the key because you obviously have uh, what are known as cyber proxies where there are various degrees of relationship that these non-state actors have with the state, something that Michael was speaking about, uh, for, for example, the Russian uh, disinformation uh, agency, but there are other actors that also operate independently, there are actors that sell technology, there are actors that implement technology. I think all of this, this complex ecosystem requires a concerted effort and especially 
for a country like India uh, and emerging economies, there is a need to have a say in this ongoing negotiations. So what are the ongoing negotiations? I, you touched upon one of them in your opening, uh, Gurmeer, but let me just kind of talk about very quickly the four kinds of ongoing uh, global uh, negotiations that are, are in place and India uh, and other countries have had a number of interesting things to say. So on the multilateral front, uh, the, the story really starts in 1998 when uh, Russia had first advocated for a cyber treaty that didn't really go ahead. But what we had were now six group of governmental experts in the United Nations who are debating the kinds of questions that I was uh, I, I was talking about. You know, how do you how do states behave responsibly in, in cyberspace? What are the norms for responsible behavior? And also, how does international law apply? In 2018, there was another more, so the uh, group of governmental experts was limited. The open-ended working group was had all uh, UN members and of course, India made some uh, contributions uh, to that. And really the, 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 the question here is how do we uh, regulate cyberspace, especially given that there are ideological disagreements on key questions like a, a group of states, the US, uh, the NATO countries believe that international law as is applies in its entirety. We don't need a new treaty, whereas um, other countries, China and Russia, believe that we need a new uh, binding agreement that applies specifically to, to cyberspace. So you have this divide and India has not really uh, uh, weighed in clearly on, on, onto this debate. And that may be for various strategic uh, reasons. So that's the multilateral uh, debate. But that's only one aspect of it. There's a number of multi-stakeholder initiatives. You may mention the Paris call that was a joint initiative of uh, France and the micro uh, France, 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 and Microsoft, uh, the Global Commission on Stability of Cyberspace and several other multi-stakeholder initiatives. There are private sector initiatives, the Tech Accord, uh, the Charter of Trust by Siemens. So the, and of course, there are standard setting bodies, which are critical because how standards are set is critical both to the security of the internet and to the preservation of rights online. So there are all these diplomatic uh, initiatives going on. There are, um, uh, you know, uh, new challenges in cyberspace. And I think that to end, let me answer the question that you had posed, which was on that specific incident. Of course, I, I don't want to go into whether there was enough evidence that uh, recording future actually put put a for forward to exactly what happened because there were a number of reports. But I will say when we talk about India's uh, uh, cyber security, I think what we need to look at are basically three uh, three questions. And and one is of course to what extent is that uh, a strategic priority? And obviously I think it is given going from by the statements that have been made by uh, actors in the government, but also conversations like this where multi-stakeholder actors and private sector are coming together. Cybersecurity, given that India is a rapidly digitizing economy, but is also at the receiving end of cyber attacks, it's definitely a priority. The second question is, do we have the institutional coherence? And by that, I mean, not just, of course, there is the computer emergency response team under the Ministry of Elec uh, Electronics and Information Technology, but there is also um, the Ministry of External Affairs, there is the Home uh, Ministry of Home Affairs. How do they collaborate to shape India's stance and also at, at global forums and also shape India's cyber defense? And cyber defense is not just about protecting from harms. It's also about ensuring the security and rights of, of Indian citizens. So, for example, when India banned uh, the Chinese applications in, in June of 2020 and again in September, it wasn't only on the grounds of security, it was also on the basis of rights. So, India's constitutional fiber becomes important there. And the final question is, when we talk about the recording future report and the attack on the Mumbai grid or otherwise, to what extent are stakeholders consulted? So, and I think that is part of any conversation on India. To what extent are various uh, civil society actors, private actors, to what extent are they a part of the conversation? I think those are kind of my initial uh, thoughts on what India's cybersecurity ecosystem should uh, uh, start to question based on the kinds of attacks that we've uh, we faced. So uh, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arunjit, for, for, for going into such great detail and, and, and breaking down the sort of landscape of cyber warfare for all of us. Um, my my question, my next question is to uh, Dr. Shelke. Um, you know, we, Arindraji did talk about the need for uh, a multi-stakeholder uh, coming together and talking about cyber peace, uh, people come, you know, uh, private companies, individuals. My question to you is, uh, how should, how should we enforce these cybersecurity standards and what are these cybersecurity standards that we're looking looking for? 
um, because this conversation is very new um, and I'd love your thoughts uh, on it. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, at the outset, uh, we have to understand that cyber attack is done by two different entities. One, it is a state-driven attack. Now, in case of state-driven attack, uh, and if it is done by the head, heads are exempted from the criminal liability, and that is under national law. There is a general uh, international law wherein some liability can be imposed when I'm talking about national law. Two, non-state-driven or state-supported activity wherein it can be punished under the national law. So we have to work on multiple level and there shall be multi-level or multi-dimensional approach starting from preventive. So in case of preventive, it will be ranged from the security standard, education and diplomacy and creation of infrastructure. Now recently India started the Forensic and Cyber University in Gujarat. Similar kind of education shall be provided. What in context right now, the people who are working in the investigation of cyber are not well trained. The regular people who are police are shifted to cyber cell. So they are not understanding of, of the things. So that is on creation level, prevention level. Two, there shall be strong mechanism or at the correction level or restoring level. So in Bombay, we have little bit experience, but tomorrow there may be worse experience than this. And there is no adequate mechanism to restore the existing damage done. I mean, sir, I refer the cert, and there is uh, some uh, uh, small, small mechanism created by the central government, but that is not enough if it is at large scale. So there shall be state-wise mechanism. There shall be city-wise mechanism. So if it is happening in the Bombay, we should not call center team. I mean, help of the center team can be taken, but city-wise mechanism can be there. Three, there shall be infinity, well infinity mechanism. And in that, we have created a lot of problem while framing the cyber law. The first thing which is required in case of cyber is or any offenses, there shall be jurisdiction to the court. And at jurisdiction level, we have section 75 of IT Act, which demands that computer, computer mechanism and computer system shall be located in India. But if something is outside India, which is not like located in India, our data of ministry is outside or something is going on in the outside of India, or it is in satellite or attack is on satellite and through something is done. We don't have jurisdiction because at the time of attack, that satellite was not located in India. So under legal framework, there is no jurisdiction. There is no question of punishment at all. In 2008, there was amendment to the IPC. Similar amendment is the same condition is kept that the computer, computer mechanism or network shall be located in India. So first, the legal approach we have to change for that purpose. In France, there is very simple definition. They say whenever their citizen and country is affected, they will have jurisdiction. So that is corrective and penalty or remedial uh, level, one of the uh, uh, multidimensional. Uh, you are asking or you are asked about uh, the international framework or cooperation. Now, in case of international framework, there is no existing international framework for the cyber. For example, under section 166AA of CRPC, we have written, central government has written more than 100 letters to the neighboring country in order to get access for the investigation. And I, I don't think anybody has given access. I mean, in my knowledge, nobody has given access for investigation. So there is no investigation. There is no proof created. There is no question of punishment. There is no question of taking action. So there shall be supranational body at, at the international level, which will take care of the investigation at least. Two, this type of offenses shall be declared as universal jurisdiction. So irrespective of an attack on particular, there is concept of universal jurisdiction under international law. Where in irrespective of the attack on particular country, any country can take action. That is advantage number one. Advantage number two, under section 90 of Rome Convention, if it is under universal jurisdiction, there shall be compulsory extradition. So in multiple situations, there are no prime PC proof created. So it is difficult to prove that person because there is no investigation. So it is difficult to prove that person has done. And therefore, there is no question of taking action at all. Three, in case of uh, 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 conflict of laws, if you want to take action under national laws. So our laws are conflicting with other countries. They are protected different rights. Like one of the examples, and there are multiple examples I will not take off. We have right to be silent in front of court, irrespective of who is asking the question. That is fundamental right, Article 20, Clause 3. Whereas in all European countries, 
there is something known as adverse inference to be drawn. What it means? If prior physics case is proved, judge is asking the question and uh, accused is not responding to that question, it will be assumed that he is culprit and therefore he is not answering the question. So if you want to extradite the person, the first problem will be violation of fundamental right of individual, which will not permit to extradite the person. So there shall be, there is, and there are other conflicts also definitely. So there shall be some common standard which shall be followed by the group. Three, there shall be trained people available on international level which will do independent investigation 24 by 7. So there is no international security provided. In case of attack, we can ask help of a particular country or UNO to protect our country. But in case of cyber, there is no mechanism. Like in case of, uh, you know, uh, WHO, uh, health, etc. There is some mechanism at least. But cyber, there is no mechanism. And therefore, there is need to have international framework. Two, there is need to strengthen the national framework. And there, there is need to remove the small, small problems which are created by ourselves, which are permitted by international law. But we have created like problem of jurisdiction as spoken. And there are multiple other problems. It can be addressed later on also. Because I do not want to uh, consume a lot of time of other speakers also. So that was from my side. Thank you. No, Dr. Shalke, thank you so much. Everything that you said is absolutely important and sets, you know, the sort of landscape of, of cyber warfare very well and, and, and the limitations of societies across the world and nation states across the world. Uh, and it brings me to my next question and anyone from the panel um, can feel free to take it. But what do you think, you know, what do you think, given how grim the situation is when it comes down to international cooperation and the framework that we have even nationally in our country. What do you think is the future of state-sponsored cyber attacks? Uh, and what do you think it will look like if it's left unchecked the way it is right now? Um, and specifically, are there any trends that you see expanding? Uh, and anyone from the panel, please feel free to um, take this question. Happy to happy to start. I, I think this goes to like <laughs> the attribution point that I that I made earlier. I think states had been traditionally very hesitant to call out other countries uh, for cyber attacks on their nationals, their businesses, uh, or, or the state organs themselves. But I was really surprised when I was reaching, researching for today that Australia had made three attributions just this year. Uh, like that pace. Is is that that is a lot? Uh, we hadn't we hadn't been making that many at all in the past. I think really we had only started making them from about 2017. Uh, I think the complexity behind it, the impact like on the diplomatic relationship that these types of attributions can have, is really damaging. So it, it does mean a lot when a country is willing to stand up and and, and say to another country. We we know you did this because it's not it's, they don't usually uh, in all of the ones that I've seen from Australia we're not saying we think it was you we're saying we know it was X country uh, and you've made and you've done X X actions um, so I think you know it's not completely unchecked I think states are starting to form a bit of a um, it is becoming more normal that they will stand up and call each other to account. Uh, so, so whilst it might not be that there are repercussions beyond that necessarily at the moment, I think that's something and some movement and it seems like it's moving quite quickly. No, that's that's absolutely true. Um, anyone else who would want to maybe follow up or have any thoughts um, to add to what Mr. Brown just said? May I Of course, yes, sir. Yeah, uh, so... Uh, if, uh, we have to think from two perspectives with respect to cyber warfare, that is on international level of state sponsored cyber warfare. One, what the state want to achieve. Two, how it can be achieved. What the state can want to achieve, how it can be achieved. Now, if you compare the traditional war, it is very difficult to attack on the country and to get the access. Whereas in case of cyber, you can sit at any corner of the world and attack can be done. So it is easy to attack. So state uh, state uh, want to achieve the uh, three things in case of any war. One, or in any uh, weapon. One, there shall, in, there shall be frequency, there shall be impact, and there shall be accuracy. And that is the principle of this war in general, that if you are creating a weapon, 
weapon, I mean, there shall be frequent attack. So th there will be damage of the country too. There shall be impact and there can be very wide impact of the cyber attack. Three, there shall be accuracy achieved and all three can be achieved with easiness. Whereas if you want to attack with the help of military, it takes a lot of strength, it takes a lot of money and it will be evident to entire globe that is not happening in the cyber war. And therefore, there will be more cyber warfare as compared to actual attack in the future. That is my personal opinion. And therefore, as a country, we have to prepare. And as a globe, we have to prepare on the international level. Yeah. Um, Arinduji, would you have any more um, thoughts to add? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So, so very quickly, I think my personal opinion as an academic would be that we need some sort of legally binding norms that are actionable. The issue is that geopolitically, that's probably not going to happen. And the reason is simply that if we look at the state's desires to constrain their behavior with regard to technological regimes, there is this kind of control versus crisis continuum. So if you look at what led to, say, the nuclear or the space uh, agreements, the, especially the outer space treaty that was negotiated really fast. States foresaw a crisis fairly fast if some sort of restraint was not placed on nuclear weapons being placed in outer space. For, this, for whatever reason, because of the asymmetric advantages and capabilities that cyberspace gives you and the kind of advantages it gives you, uh, it gives states by, by retaining a strategic advantage without going into all out war, that control crisis continuum is shifting in favor of control where states want to continue uh, de devising and uh, enriching their capabilities in cyberspace without necessarily accepting constraints as of yet. Of course, there are a group of states that argue that international law applies, but then of course, how does it apply is, is a key question. So we won't have a legally binding agreement. So what does that leave us with? And I think that's the conversation that is happening both at multi-stakeholder and multilateral regimes, which is confidence building measures, which is kind of how can we exchange information better? How can we do attribution better through uh, collective uh, processes where which are multinational and multi-stakeholder. Um, how can we uh, be more transparent, be, open up our capabilities to verification, so take low-hanging fruit. And the second is non-binding norms, which are essentially collective expectations that state impose states impose on each other and on non-state actors, not through a legally binding agreement, but through uh, collective expectations that then incrementally build towards something more binding. So I think we are in this unfortunate situation where personally, I think we should have something binding, but uh, unfortunately, that's me speaking very in, in a utopian fashion and not realistically. So maybe that is my, uh, let, let, let me stop there. So that's my hope that, uh, but also uh, realism uh, coming in there. Thank you. Arindrajit, we're all very, you know, we're all idealists here. We're talking about peace and peace in a, in a world living here. Are, it's a conversation only idealists have. So we're all, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I back you with your uto utopian world ideas. But, you know, talking about, you know, our own personal thoughts and feelings, I want to ask Samriti and, and Erin, you know, what's driving you to bring cyber warfare to international spotlight? I mean, Erin, you want to start or like I can? Go go for it, Samriti. Okay, okay. Can you please repeat it? Because I was just about to add something which, which is an Arin Reed who had just said yeah, that I am... Free. I, I just feel free to add there. Sorry. Samrathi, feel free to add yeah. to what he said. But yeah. also maybe, yeah. you know, my question to you and Evan is, you know, what is driving you to bring cyber warfare into a more international spotlight or even like national spotlight? What's driving you to work on um, this very important but very niche subject? Yeah. So uh, first I'll add, like, I agree what he basically said that we, it is not possible to have something binding. But what I think that, you know, like any of the country, uh, we can have like a basically call principles so that it can be framed. Uh, like, you know, uh, what I will say, like the Paris call principle, they, there were like nine principles which uh, which were there about protecting individuals and infrastructures, protecting the internet, defending electoral process, defending the intellectual property. It was like non-proliferation uh, pro, uh, pro, pro, uh, and uh, life cycle security, cyber hygiene. I mean, these sort of principles 
can come up and which can actually help because it is it is something you know it is debatable it is never ending because i know that there will be a jurisdictional issue there is a conflict of laws you know as dr atmaram said i agree like you know it is very difficult to frame so the only thing is what can be the solution the only solution is if somebody can come like some country can frame so, uh, some sort of a principles uh, like that so this is what so this is how even you know all the countries can get a spotlight related to you know cyber security and how each and every country can actually fight uh, against the cyber war yeah so thank you so much samrithi uh, and moving on to erin uh, i asked samrithi this question and i'll ask you you know what is what is the driving force uh, behind your work you know why why is it so important for you to to work on cyber warfare Thank you so much. So I think um one of the things that stuck out for me was some uh one of the speakers said what is self defense in cyberspace. And I think there's something that um while I do agree that a lot of international organizations are working on guidelines and principles and I agree with you in the ideal world let's have a a universal code of conduct or a universal set of of laws. it's it's not possible because everybody's perception of what is ethical and everybody's perception of what is legal is going to be different all right so erin did tell us uh that she might drop out uh because of load shedding in the area that she's in she's currently working in africa and um there are some connectivity issues uh, it was, this is not a cyber attack oh did i did i disconnect for a moment <laughs> yeah my Good. apologies but i was just telling all our attendees that this is not a cyber attack it's just um, no cheating <laughs> the internet <laughs> no i was just saying that i think that there needs to be um something about the 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 role of of whistleblowers and civil society actors which i think was spoken about and that's my background a little bit um people like you know we we've heard about cases like edward snowden and who have revealed sort of the unethical behavior of governments and surveillance technologies and and governments targeting other governments in other countries and i think uh the importance of protecting or uh, encouraging whistleblowers also becomes important how do we protect whistleblowers when they do come forward to to bring this information to the forefront and just a little example from south africans uh, south africa perspective is uh, we've been for the last uh, say 20 years involved in what has been labeled as state capture and uh one of the the ways it it's a sort of uh, project of corruption in the country where the state certain individuals have benefited uh personally from the state um part of that was a lot of disinformation campaigns that were started using social media as a weapon to detract from the corruption that was taking place the sort of organized corruption and put the country on a little bit of a back foot and uh the only way that that came out um specifically the the disinformation campaigns and so on um was through whistleblowers and those whistleblowers bringing forward information that showed that a UK company called Bell Pottinger had actually started using Twitter and a lot of artificial intelligence as well as people that they were paying to start a race bait campaign they called it race bait to basically incite racial violence in South Africa and with our history as it is that sort of incitement would completely destabilize our country and would also destabilize the government so the fact that these whistleblowers coming forward and bringing this evidence to the forefront and the journalists and so on being able to publish about this um which i do believe is cyber warfare it's it's the weaponizing of social media to to destabilize the country um the the way that they did that these these disinformation uh campaigns that that basically changed the cultural discourse of south africa 
and and the ability to fight back to defend ourselves against that uh, with the transparency of information, I think, becomes really important. And we've seen it not here, but in other countries as well. We've seen Cambridge Analytica um, change the, the outcome of, of election campaigns in the US and Trinidad and Tobago. I think anybody who's watched The Great Hack would have seen that. Um, but I think also what's really important to understand with these, these case studies, say like the Bell Pottinger case study, um, which, by the way, that company also created fake uh, videos to promote the Iraq war. And they were hired by the U.S. Pentagon back in, in 2006. So this is not new. I mean, these are PR companies being hired to start these disinformation campaigns um, using social media as their platform to, to destabilize countries. What's scary is that it's often independent actors from outside of the country. So the cy cyberspace has opened that up for us. You know, somebody sitting in the UK can destabilize the government in South Africa. And I think that's something that, that needs to be also uh, looked at. How do we defend ourselves then in cyberspace from actors we can't see and who are not even in our country itself? Um, so I think the, there is also a place in discussing how do we promote transparency? How do we promote people blowing the whistle on big organizations. Yeah. Okay, I think we lost Erin again. And while it, if Erin takes time to come back, uh, I would love to um, announce that we'll, we've opened a Q&A session for another, another 30 minutes for the attendees. Um, and while the attendees are typing their questions, um, please feel free to write the questions in the chat. And while the attendees are typing the questions, I would want to ask um, a question to everyone on the panel and anyone can pick it up. Um, you know, we, we've spoken about, we've spoken about uh, multiple, multiple things, the need for governments to come on board, the need for private companies to come on board. Uh, my, my question moving forward is, you know, what is our personal responsibility when it comes down to um, combating the issue of cyber warfare? Um, and once we're done with this question, maybe also if you have any thoughts on how, you know, someone who's involved in regular policy uh, or how can we how can we push our policymakers uh, to combat cyber warfare? Uh, I would love to know if you have any ideas, free flowing. Of course, Simriti, go for it. Yeah. So uh, there is a kind of a program which is called Big Bounty Program. It is something, it is our responsibility to the government to tell that, see, this is a security vulnerability. And these all are the insufficiencies in hardware or software reports. So if somebody will, you know, say something about all such insufficiency, I think uh, that program which rewards people who report security vulnerabilities. So all such kind of a program, I think that uh, all the governments should run and it should be adopted worldwide, universally. Thank you, Simriti. Uh, anyone else from the panel? And any questions from the attendees? None at all? Well, you know, we are living in a very difficult world uh, and cyber warfare is a complicated, complicated topic, something we are only just confronting um, in, in popular discourse and in popular culture. Any thoughts, feelings, opinions, questions for our attendees? I mean, just in response to your last question about what we can do to prod policymakers, I mean, to Awkwardly, I suppose I'm a policymaker, uh, so it makes it a tougher question. But I think, like, a lot of 
uh, what's happening in cyberspace, calling out malicious activity. Like there's a whole bunch of NGOs that are working in this space that are doing super interesting stuff. Uh, and for like, you know, the, the people on the panel and the attendees here, it's such a fascinating area to, you, you, once you start going down the rabbit hole and reading and researching and figuring out what's happening, you can definitely spend hours and days. Like on MH17, um, I think mean, it's just the case that I'm most familiar with, uh, that there's a there's a it's just a a group of online fact verifiers that have come together and formed an organization called Bellingcat. Now I'm not saying they're they're perfect or uh, that whatever they do is absolutely certainly correct, uh, but it's such an interesting organization. It's such an interesting group that's come together to to fact check and verify what has been going on in the investigation and what's being said. Uh, publicly by governments and um, in cyberspace, and they've debunked a whole bunch of theories and uh, you know crackpot theories around what happened. Uh, in their time, they've um, pub like they they've discovered the you know, the names and identities of hundreds of uh, GRU agents, so Russian intelligence agents, uh, by figuring out that they all. Uh, by they all rent cars from one company and they refuel the car before going back to headquarters. Uh, so I think there's like a, a wealth of information out there that if people are interested, uh, they can start to research and, and, and really inform themselves. Uh, and then I think that they can become part of the conversation as well, because I don't think governments are the only the only uh, sort of actors in this. I think there's a there's a there's a real space for informed uh, participants and viewers from from all over the world. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Brown. We do have questions from our our attendees here. Um, so there's one very interesting question, and and and, and it's a question I. It, it was the first question that came to my mind when I first confronted and encountered the world of cyber warfare and the world of um, sort of hacking. Uh, how do you, and it's Dr. Sham, Shambuling Anand, I hope I pronounced your name right. If I didn't, I deeply apologize. Uh, how do you differentiate between ethical hacking and a cyber attack? That's a very, that's a very intense question. A whole essay could be written on it, but who, if anyone would like to take this question? May I take? Please go. Please, please. Okay. Uh, so uh, for, I think we'll refer our law also. Uh, there are two, three words used. One intention, two knowledge. So these two words will differentiate what is ethical hacking and what is attack or what is offense. So what is your intention while doing that? You're supporting some company. You're supporting some government mechanism. You're supporting individual. And for that purpose, you're doing hacking. Your intention is not wrong. There is no... Uh, uh, what we say is of, uh, offense uh, done with help of that, or there is no personal gain, or it is known as in the uh, IPC, it is known as a wrongful loss or wrongful gain. So your intention and knowledge will differentiate what is ethical hacking and what is wrong hacking or an unexpected hacking. So that is a, a small, res a quick response from my side. Perfect. Thank you so much. Often we... Um Oh, there's another question. I was I was about to comment, but I think we should definitely look at uh, the questions by from our panelists. So Daniel Yadav says, recently Samriti Ma'am spoke about how government can make bodies which can reward the reporters of cyber attacks. But also I want to mention that you also mentioned how government have utilized cybersecurity for their own profit. Um, Samriti, I think it's a comment, but would you want to maybe... Um, do a quick comment to it. It is basically, you know, the sort of these all are the principles, you know, which we had basically discussed. And it is uh, these all are the programs which has already been adopted worldwide, right? So uh, just to have, you know, to keep out of uh, to keep out of these security vulnerabilities. So that is why it can even be by government. Or it can be by some sort of a campaign. So it is not only by the government itself. So it is not something. But yeah, it is a principle. So on that principle, on on the basis of that basic structure, that policy, I think the policy can be built up. So uh, 
Uh, why Samuel Lutra also has a question. So would you want to maybe ask the question yourself, but I'm happy to read it out as well. No, no, it's not from me. I think there is uh, there is some uh, error in that. This is not a question from me. Uh, there is someone else uh, who has asked that question. It's not from me. Okay, well, well ignoring, the, ignoring the error, I'll just read out what the question is. Uh, can standard settings help in dealing with cyber warfare? Technically, a couple of sticks and some motors, a transmitter and controller can be used for spying or even uh, and even carry payloads. I'm not quite sure I understand the question, but if uh, any of the panelists get what the question is uh, and would want to respond, cyber warfare. Well, I think the question is about whether setting up the standard and that may be legal standard or technical standard. I think it is from the perspective of the technical standard will stop the cyber warfare. Now, with respect to technical standard, there is no perfect technical standard which will be applied to all situation. So situation to situation, we should have different standard. And time and again, there shall be continuous research. So previously, you had asked the question that what we can suggest to the government. First, there shall be adequate research done. Like in China, there is big uh, uh, military mechanism to conduct research on the cyber warfare. So that we are lacking right now. So we should have, and then an institute like you or Timber uh, Law School Pune or any small organization can do research that is technical, which will help the defense activity later on. So it is not one stroke which will decide the uh, mechanism. So time and again, we have to find out what is the risk, where is the risk, what is the risk uh, controlling mechanism available with us? What are the new uh, viruses? What are, what are the new threat which is there or which had happened outside of the territory? And based on that time and again, we have to decide. So it is not one stroke. With respect to law, we can have some standard or some mechanism uh, which will suffice the purpose. But with respect to technology, it is changing every day and we have to change our technology. Or we have to do a lot of research in order to cope up with the change in technology. So that is from my side with respect to the standard to be set and whether one standard or bunch of standards will work against cyber warfare. Answer to that question is no, but up to some extent at least it will control, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shelke. So we have a, we have a question from Anand Nair. He, they say, with respect to cyber espionage, there's a report claiming that China has repeatedly snooped onto the service of African Union, especially around 2017. How will policymaker call out such state or non-state actors and hold them accountable? Uh, yeah, could, could I could I take this? Yeah. Uh, so so thanks for that uh, uh, for that question, and I think uh, extraterritorial uh, surveillance, and uh, I, I think it was referred to before in the context of what the Snowden revelation said about about the U.S. Um, and I think that uh, it's it's clear that I mean obviously there hasn't been uh, a whistleblower from China to really show the extent of extraterritorial practices that has been undertaken, but there's been enough of kind of research by security researchers to show that there has been some level of of extraterritorial stooping by by China as well. And I think what really needs to happen is there. The only way to, to counter that is to set a norm which says that this kind of surveillance is not, uh, is not legitimate because, uh, in, in international, uh, sorry, I, I'm, I'm still audible, right? Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Sorry. So I just thought, uh, I froze for a second, but yeah. So in international law, espionage for whatever reason has been kind of given this, uh, like gray signal in the sense that, uh, it's okay if you conduct espionage because everyone, uh, conducts uh, espionage. And, uh, I think that has allowed states to, uh, go ahead in potential violation of the standards laid down in international human rights law in the ICCPR and so on. So if we are to actually counter and even expose some of the practices that uh, this question rightly speaks about it. There needs to be a norm that says that all states, especially uh, democracies, 
uh, cannot engage in 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 these uh, practices because they undermine trust in uh, the global system of of cyberspace. So I think extraterritorial surveillance is a critical critical question, and I'm uh, glad that you asked it. If I can do a quick uh, self plug, I have a short essay out in ORF's recent uh, journal, Digital Debates, that looks at extraterritorial surveillance in a bit more detail. So yeah, if you have the time and interest, uh, do check that out. Lovely. Thank you so much. We'd love a link if there is one. Um, and we do have another question from an anonymous attendee. Are there any existing laws for online financial crimes? Our lawmaker here, Samriti. I'll tell. So, you know, it's all this attendee is only asking only existing laws for the online financial crimes. So we have, um, you know, IP Act and uh, read along with IPC if there is some sort of crime. So Indian Penal Code is, is in itself can deal with any any sort of crime and it can read along with, in, you know, uh, IP Act that, that can be, uh, you know, I don't think that there's a online financial crime there is no particular online financial crime code uh, some sort of that we have only our criminal law and along with that now we have this our it act and i think it's more than enough to deal with it thank you so much Amrithi. so we do have another another question by Soumya sharma um, it's a bit of a weak question it's a very interesting one could the panelists please shed some light on cyber warfare and gender inequality? Is there a possible connection between the two? Is there a connection between warfare in general and gender inequality? Yeah. <laughs> I've been thinking about it too. It's an interesting question. Uh, Arindajit, maybe would, if you have any thoughts, opinions? No, I, I think definitely, I mean, I'm not an expert on, on, on gender at all, so I don't want to comment on things that I don't fully know about. But just as, as a layperson, I would think definitely yes, right? Because if we look at cyber warfare as the act of one state blowing up and or, or I mean, uh, reducing the functioning of an electricity grid, then that's a very high threshold. I think there are various kinds of offensive cyber activities, uh, cyber abuse that happens on a more, much more uh, daily basis. And uh, because this definition of cyber warfare is so nebulous, and then and this is more of a question, right? Do we then ignore what you know, what's happening on a daily basis to various uh, at-risk and vulnerable communities online and uh, would therefore taking uh, a gender approach actually help us come up with a uh, better and, and uh, uh, more uh, accessible uh, definition of cyber uh, warfare. And I th in fact, I think uh, if you uh, at the open-ended working group, which I was referring to, I believe it was Canada and Australia that actually submitted a uh, a paper on the gender uh, approaches to cybersecurity. So I can share a link to that to that as well. But, but let me stop there and ask someone who's actually an expert on this. Uh, may I add a little bit in the Basu Sir's comment? Yeah, go for it, sir, please. Okay, so uh, there is no direct nexus seen between the gender and the cyber warfare or any other warfare. Uh, but in general, if you'll see, uh, uh, under we have 66 AF, wherein uh, terrorism is defined. But uh, something which is causing fear in the mind of the lady because of murder or because of rape or because of misinformation. Uh, all of people have spoken, have spoken about misinformation, that is fake news. But right now there is no definition of fake news. Lot of misinformation are not covered under the Indian legislation. So some misinformation which is directly connected with the woman may lead to gender inequality. Otherwise, I don't think there is direct impact uh, between these two because if there is... Economy is down, everybody will have problems. So it is not gender specific, but a few things like causing fear in the mind, harassment, or repetitive offense, uh, uh, or emails, or something like that, which is partially covered under the legislation, will have impact on the gender equality also. So that is additional impact, actually. No, so you're, you're completely right. Um, I mean, I, I do think that I, I don't know if there's a direct link between cyber warfare and inequality, but there's definitely a lot of work that's been done on um, cyber warfare and gender um, in itself, not particularly inequality, um, I believe. 
And so Tommy also has another question. Could social media witch hunts uh, slash doxing um, and the likes of it be considered milder, wo- milder form of cyber warfare? If anyone would want to uh, respond. Uh, so uh, right now, if you see the uh, all laws, national and international law, everywhere impact is seen. And what are that impact? One, national security, relation with foreign country. or public order is also covered in the indian context or the there is problem with respect to uh, services to be provided to the large group now which hunt is a particular incident which will cause fear in the mind of the people and which is not directly covered under the law which is not treated as war right now so it may be a simple problem of law and order right now whether it shall be considered in future or not that is the question but right now it is not covered under any law that may be cyber warfare or generic war thank you so much dr shalke again um if there are any more questions uh any comments from the panelists any again thoughts feelings or opinions that we that one might have on you know cyber warfare or any any reflections on the conversations we've had we do have we do have 10 moments to go uh for our discussion and I would love to hear from you. I wouldn't mind waiting for a couple of attendees to um send in their questions. And if there aren't any, may I ask one question to everyone on the panel? Um So it's a, well it's a complex question, but when we talk about, you know, when we talk about cyber warfare and the internet's future, and we have again spoken um you know we have spoken about multiple threats and somya is talking about gender and you know we're talking about social media um which and uh, and we're talking about um you know financial crimes so when we talk about cyber warfare what cyber threat concerns you the most Uh if I may come in sorry my camera is off because I'm actually moving to try and get better signal. Um I think one of the biggest things that I am fearful of now is the the rising number of attacks on um state run companies. Uh I read somewhere recently in Institute of Security Studies uh which is a institute here in South Africa that said that maritime agencies so ports and and uh shipping agencies of various countries cyber attacks on them have increased by 400% in the last 2 years um specifically because of of covid-19 because a lot of there's a lot of new types of of cyber warfare and cyber attacks that are happening as people are online um in south africa in july we had uh, our main port entity had to de- uh, had to f- do a force majeure um and close down all the ports uh which already were under strain because of the lack of of produce and containers and shipping that happened because of covid-19 restrictions and lockdown and all of a sudden our export imports just took a massive knock and um some of the the shipping contain or the the container ships and so on actually just skipped our ports completely and went to the next place um creating a massive supply chain issue uh, and this was on the back of of some other uh, difficulties that we'd had in the country and when you read up about these there's more and more of these attacks happening on state resources and i think that's a big i think that there's a vulnerability there that we haven't really addressed there's a vulnerability in our maritime agencies in our um state uh, our state run companies that are supplying resources Uh, to the country and uh, that's going to become more and more scary i think if if things are not put in place to try and counteract those thank you so much aaron that's um, that's very true um so anand nair has another question is it difficult and and i believe we can we can make this our final question for the evening uh, and i'd love to bring in um 
you know, Dr. Shelke after. Uh, but Anand's question is, is it difficult to come up with a global rules-based order to set up a universal code or regulation and a code of justice to heavily crack down on cyber warfare, cyber espionage, and in general, improve, promote, and strengthen cybersecurity and digital privacy? Um, would anyone want to take this question? And I can repeat if you want to, but the question is also in the chat if anyone wants to look at it. There are better lawyers than me here, and, and they can speak to the more legal elements. But I think from a more political and uh, uh, international relations perspective, yes, it's hard. Uh, we have the International Court of Justice and we have the ICC, the International Court of, uh, the International Criminal Court, uh, and they were incredibly difficult to negotiate uh, and to establish. They have limited scope and limited uh, uh, matters that they can decide on. Uh, I think what we've heard about today is that there is quite a bit of division in how we should regulate cyberspace. You might be able to create uh, a couple of different courts that could hive off into a couple of different camps, uh, but but whether that would be effective because you, if you're having attacks from across the different camps, how would they adjudicate? Uh, it, 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 it's a very difficult issue that states are discussing. Uh, it would be very tough. Very true. Um, Samriti, uh, Arindra Ji, uh, thoughts, feelings? Um, it's like uh, this, we have already, you know, answered it before that it's very hard to have global rules, right, regulation, because as Dr. Atmaram uh, Shalke also discussed that, you know, our constitution, like, you know, our fundamental rights, we cannot expect such kind of rights, you know, globally the same. Uh, though there are most of it, uh, there are concepts of laws and there are contradictions, you know. So what uh, what I really like, what Mr. Uh, Dr. Atmaram uh, said earlier, that what we can have is we can have a compulsory extradition, uh, like, you know, with other uh, countries. And if some sort of a extradition related to the cyber, uh, you know, war or uh, cyber attack. So I think uh, uh, that can be a solution to it. But uh, right now there is no mechanism, but yeah, it's a hard reality. We have to take it. I, uh, I fully thank agree you. with, uh, yeah, I th thank you. Uh, I, I just, I'll just take 30 seconds because I fully agree with, uh, with Samridhi. I think what, uh, and this has been de described uh, uh, as some, something that pro Professor Joseph Nye has called a regime complex, where you'll basically have different regulations for different issues. So on the issue of data exchange, exchange and cyber crime, data transfers and cyber crime uh, cooperation, you will probably have one regime, you'll probably have another regime on cybersecurity, another a very, very important regime on digital trade. Uh, and there's an important uh, discussion happening with WTO and the ministerial coming up at the end of November and India and South Africa are doing very interesting things there. So I think you'll have a number of uh, uh, different regimes. All we can hope for is kind of pushing the needle as multi-stakeholder actors to, uh, in as many regimes as as we as we possibly can and which is why again while i'm by no means an expert on that it's it, the idea of kind of linking it with other disciplines and linking uh, cyber security with, with with gender and i posted a couple of links which i found are really helpful but trying to kind of uh, be multi-stakeholder and multidisciplinary and push the needle on various regimes rather than hoping that a binding regime will come about because yeah as as michael said it's uh geopolitically that is an unlikely conclusion so yeah i fully agree and uh yeah thank you very much uh thank you so much Arindri. it was so nice hearing you and then all the panels uh, all the panelists by Ad admiral luta thank you so much sir for your um opening remarks uh, michael brown thank you so much uh, for being on the panel arindrajit uh, samriti erin uh, for bringing such interesting and lively points to the discussion that could you know that is often uh, that can often be very tedious uh, and i would love to have uh, you know, bring in uh, Dr. Shelke for a few last words. 
thank you ma'am uh, with uh, uh, just now uh, other expert were discussing about of uh, international legal framework or whether there is possibility of cooperation now there is very old saying uh, known as uh, nida is mother of uh, all invention so right now uh, every country is insecure and there is constant threat and therefore there is very high possibility that tomorrow there may be something like wto mechanism which will work partially and it will create pressure on the uh, state sponsor and non state sponsor uh, cyber warfare uh, that is for the international law two for the with respect to international law we may have more security operation center in all state there shall be security center and city wise also center can be created and there shall be central mechanism which will support each other two there shall be multiple data centers because uh, uh, in many uh, situation uh, data which is either on the cloud and if it is on the cloud we don't have jurisdiction under Indi indian inter indian laws that we have already discussed it a bit but inside of the india there will be multiple data center so there is problem with respect to one center there shall be the backup of that data somewhere and that is not relating to critical data only with respect to other data also same principle can be applied uh, for there shall be more honey pots and what is the honey pot it is continuous security check uh, pot or center so right now at center level or military level there are some uh, mechanism like defense cyber agency there uh, cyber information security division is there under home ministry right now national critical information infrastructure center under section 70a is created and there is section 70a b c d is also there but right now i will see the insecurity which is created because of cyber warfare that is not enough and therefore there there shall be more honey pots which will check security regularly and there shall be policy uh, not only change in the law but there shall be change in the policy we have to spend adequate money on the research and the security and the risk check so uh, that is the concluding remark from my side thank you thank you so much sir um and i would like to again you know um reinstate this and thank all the panelists uh, vice admiral lutra for your time for your uh, wise words and for just shedding light on this topic um and i would like to also talk about talk a little bit about digital peace now my organization um so it's a global movement of over 130000 digital citizens from across 170 countries you know we celebrate the internet uh you know it's a space that we look for connection and opportunity and inspiration and the goal and the motivation is that we will not allow the internet to become a battlefield uh, we have two demands which is the governments to number one stop engaging in cyber warfare and the second for world leaders to come and take action to prevent a future where state sponsored cyber attacks do not disrupt our daily life and stability of this modern world that we live in um and to all the attendees who are attending if you want to be part of the movement uh please feel free to uh you can follow us on digital peace now you can connect with us we can speak to you more about the movement the the cause uh, and the things we do and if you want to get involved we do have a website and i will quickly put a link to it um i can't find everyone in the chat but i would quickly give orf the link to the website it's called digitalpeacenow.org and please feel free to uh please feel free to follow us go to our website sign up to our newsletter and yeah the link has been sent again thank you so much for this wonderful evening uh, and hope you have a lovely lovely evening uh, forward good night thank you